in 8.8, .8, um, and this is the last section for our chapter 8, we're going to look at another type of integral. And there's going to be two cases that we're going to look at. We're going to look at this first case where our limits of integration are either negative infinity or positive infinity. And then we're going to look at the second case where somewhere on the interval of integration our function is unbounded, meaning that there's going to be some vertical asymptote in there. So this would be where we have a vertical asymptote. Our first example, if we look at number one, the upper limit of integration is infinity. So when we evaluate our integral, we can't plug in infinity. We can't evaluate something at infinity. So the strategy would be to replace infinity with some constant, and typically we'll use b because that's what we usually use for an upper limit of integration. And then after we evaluate the, the integral with our constant b, then we'll look at the limit as b goes to infinity. Case number two would be if the lower limit is negative infinity. Again, I can't plug negative infinity when I evaluate, so I'm going to need to do a temporary substitution, and we'll use a. We'll first evaluate the integral and then take the limit as a goes to negative infinity. Now the third case is if both the upper and the lower limits of integration are positive and negative infinity, well then we're just going to have to pick some arbitrary c value, uh, and usually we just let c be zero. We'll replace the lower limit, the negative infinity, with a, and we'll create one piece from a to c, which c can be any number you choose, and evaluate that integral plus another integral where we replace b, and evaluate that second integral. So you got to break it up into two pieces. If when we evaluate our integral, the limit does exist, it's equal to some number, then what we say is we say that our integral will converge to whatever that number is. If when we evaluate we get negative or positive infinity, we say that the integral diverges. So let's look at an example. In example one, we want to evaluate this integral from 0 to positive infinity, uh, the integrand is e to the negative 2x. So the first thing I want to do is I want to replace this infinity with b and look at evaluating the limit as b goes to infinity of my integral b to 0 of e to the negative 2x dx. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to evaluate this integral. After we've evaluated it, then we're going to take the limit. Well, I have a problem with the exponent negative 2x. I don't know how to evaluate that integral. So I'm going to do a substitution u equal to negative 2x. So my du is going to be negative 2 dx or du over negative 2 is equal to dx. And I'm going to do a temporary substitution. I'm not going to change my limits of integration. That'll just be a, a bit too much here. So I'm going to leave them off. This becomes e to the u du over negative 2. And now that negative 1 half, I can pull it out in the front. And I don't have to pull it in the front of the integral. I can pull it all the way in front of the limit. 
So negative one half times the limit as b goes to infinity of my integral e to the u du, which is just e to the u. So we have negative one half, the limit as b goes to infinity, and this will become e to the u. I'm gonna go ahead and substitute back in the negative two x, and then put my limit b and zero back on. So let's evaluate. Again, we'll save the limit for the last. And note that this is 1 over e to the positive 2x. So it's 1 over e to the 2b minus e to the 0. And then e to the 0 is just going to be 1. So we have negative 1 half times the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 over e to the 2b minus 1. So as b goes to infinity, my denominator is getting larger and larger and larger. So this whole fraction is getting closer and closer to zero. So I have one half, the limit as b goes to infinity is just negative one. So this is positive one half. And we say that our integral converges. It converges to one half. So what I'd like to do is just take a quick sketch of this function, e to the negative 2x. What happens is it gets closer and closer and closer and closer to the x-axis. And this is not mathematical at all. Essentially what we're saying is if our function approaches the x-axis fast enough, then we can compute this area. If it takes a while, then we can't. It's going to diverge because the area is going to keep growing and growing and growing without bound. So let's look at another example. We're going to evaluate this integral from positive infinity to zero. And now notice that this positive infinity is going to give me a problem. So I'm going to replace that with a b and evaluate the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from b to 0. I'm going to write this as x to the 1 half. So we have the limit as b goes to infinity An antiderivative would be 2x to the 3 halves over 3, which we will evaluate from b to 0. So we have the limit as b goes to infinity of 2b to the 3 halves over 3 minus 0. And notice as b gets larger and larger, this whole fraction it's getting closer and closer to positive infinity. So this lim limit is equal to infinity. And since it's equal to infinity, we say that it diverges. So if we do a quick sketch of our integrand, which is square root of x, you see that it keeps growing and growing and growing. So if I were to compute the area here, it just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. So it makes sense that in this particular case, it diverges. We're going to look at a special type of integral called a p-integral. And it's called a p-integral because it's 1 over x to the power of p. 
So p is just the exponent on x. And it's actually really nice because if p happens to be less than or equal to 1, then this integral is going to be equal to infinity, so it diverges. If the exponent p is strictly greater than 1, then the value of the integral is going to be 1 over p minus 1, and the integral converges. So for example, in example 3, we don't have to compute that integral. Notice that this is a p integral. So we can just use this property, oops, can't spell integral. So it's a p integral where p is equal to 33, which is clearly greater than 1. So I know this is going to converge, and I know what it converges to. I know it's going to converge to or be equal to 1 over 33 minus 1, or 1 over 32. So if you do have a p integral, it's super nice because you get either convergence or divergence right away. Okay. So we'll look at our last case. We'll look at what happens when our limits of integration are giving us problem. Okay, notice it's not negative or positive infinity, but let's just say that our function is okay at b, but not at a. So let's just say the lower limit, sorry. So the lower limit is where there's a vertical asymptote. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace that with some letter, and we typically use c, but you could use whatever we want. And we'll do the same strategy we did before. We'll first evaluate the integral and then take the limit as our substitute c gets closer and closer to that vertical asymptote a. Okay, So the first case is where your lower limit gives you a problem. The second case is where the upper limit b gives you a problem. Okay? So if b turns out to be where there's a vertical asymptote, then we'll just have to replace b with, typically we use c, evaluate the limit after we evaluate the integral. Sometimes we have a problem within the limits of integration. So there's some point between a and b where there's a vertical asymptote. Well then you have to split it up into two integrals. So let's say the lower limit is okay, but at some p in between a and b we have a problem. Uh, then we're going to have to separate into two integrals and then do what we did in parts one and two, take the limit. So let's look at example four. In example four, uh, the upper limit one is a problem because at one, the denominator is zero, and it turns out that that's where there's a vertical asymptote. But notice I don't have a problem with zero. I'm fine with zero. So if we look at our interval, zero is okay, one is not. Okay? Our function is not defined at one. So as we go from zero to one, approaching from the left, we can substitute 1 with c and look at the limit as c approaches 1. But again, we're coming in from the left of my integral 0 to c of x cubed over x to the fourth minus 1 dx. And this looks like it would be really nice if I did a u substitution on the denominator x to the fourth minus 1, which will give me du is 4x to the third dx, or du over 4 is equal to x to the third dx. And I can replace the x to the third dx with du. 
the x to the fourth minus one with u to get the limit. As c approaches one from the left, leave off my limits of integration. This is one over u du over four, right? Which means I can pull out that one fourth and take the limit as c goes to one from the left. This integral is going to be natural log. So it's the natural log of the absolute value of u, but u was x to the fourth minus one. And now that I'm back with x, I can add my limits of integration back on. So this is what I'm evaluating. One fourth, the limit, as c goes to the one from the left of the natural log of the absolute value of c to the four minus one minus natural log absolute value of negative one. And the natural log of the absolute value of negative one is the natural log of one, which is zero. So I'm going to evaluate this limit. As a reminder, the natural log function looks like this. So as we're approaching 1, as c is approaching 1 from the left, what's happening to the natural log of the absolute value of c to the 4 minus 1 is within the absolute values, we're getting closer and closer to 0. So it's the natural log getting closer and closer to 0 with positive values. So we're approaching 0 from the right, which means this is negative infinity. So this is 1 fourth times negative infinity, which is just negative infinity. And the integral diverges. Now that makes sense to me. Um, so let's look at where there's a vertical asymptote. Another example, this example is a little bit difficult to evaluate because notice that the upper limit and the lower limit give me undefined denominator and for both it turns out that at 2 and negative 2 this integrand has a vertical asymptote. So I'm going to have to break this up into two pieces. I'm going to choose some value between negative 2 and 2. 0 would be really nice, right? 0 is somewhere in there. And we'll go lower limit negative 2 to 0 of 1 over the square root of 4 minus x squared dx uh, plus, and we'll look at the integral. Upper limit is 2. We'll go to 0 of 1 over the square root of 4 minus x squared dx. So all I've done was broken this up into two pieces since both of my endpoints are giving me a problem. Now I'm just going to look at this first integral and then I'll worry about the second one later. Negative 2 gives me a problem but the 0 is okay. So when I do a substitution and evaluate the limit, I'm going to be coming in and approaching negative 2 from the right. So just this one piece is going to be the limit as c, I'll use c, approaches negative 2 from the right. The integral is going to go 0 to c, 1 over the square root of 4 minus x squared dx. Okay, so I'll worry about the second integral later. 
And this integrand actually is going to be sine inverse. So it's going to be the limit as c goes to negative 2 from the right of sine inverse of x over 2 evaluated from 0 to c, which is the limit as c goes to negative 2 from the right of sine inverse of 0, which will turn out to be 0, minus sine inverse of c over 2. Okay. So again, this is going to be 0. And think about plugging in negative 2. This is going to be sine inverse of negative 1. Sine inverse of negative 1 is going to equal to some value, right? Um, so how we figure this out is we look at what sine of, I'll just use theta, when sine of theta is equal to negative 1. And that would be when theta is equal to 3 pi over 2, except 3 pi over 2 is not in the domain of sine inverse. So I have to use negative pi over 2. Uh, so this is going to be equal to, don't forget, we still have this minus in front. So this is going to be equal to negative, negative pi over 2, which is equal to pi over 2. Now going back to our integrand, something really nice. Notice that our limits of integration are 2 and negative 2. And this function is an even function. So we can use symmetry. Or you can just compute that integral as well. But I'm lazy. So by symmetry, the second integral is going to converge to pi over 2 as well. So the value of this original integral is going to be pi over 2 plus pi over 2 or just pi. Right? And our integral converges. Okay. So in example six, we want to find the volume of the solid rotated about the x-axis and bounded by the function f of x, the x-axis, and the interval from 1 to 2. So first of all, what I want to do is sketch the graph. And here we have one. Again, this is just a sketch to 2. Now you could use your calculator for this, your graphing calculator. If I was to graph my function f of x, it's going to have an asymptote at 1, and the function will come down and sort of stop here at 2. So I'm going to rotate this piece about the x-axis to create this volume okay. like so. So hopefully you recall from Calculus 1 the disk method when computing volumes. So let's look at a representative slice. And a representative slice is a disk or circle where the radius r is equal to the value of the function, which would be x minus 1 to the negative 1 half. 
when we compute the volume, what we're going to do is we're going to add up all these discs or all these circles from 1 to 2. So the volume is going to be the integral. Upper limit is 2, lower is 1 of each disc. Each disc has an area of pi r squared, the area of a circle. So it's going to be pi r squared with respect to our variable x. And I know what r is. r is x minus 1 to the negative 1 half. Oops. And then I'm going to take this quantity and I'm going to square it. And here we can take the constant pi and move it out into the front. So our integral is going to be pi times the integral of 1 to 2 of x minus 1 to the negative 1, since these 2's will cancel. And I think I'm going to write that as 1 over x minus 1 dx. Unfortunately, at 1, there's a vertical asymptote. So to evaluate this integral, I'm going to pull the pi all the way out in the front. I have to look at the limit. And here I'm going to replace 1 with the variable c. As c approaches 1 from the, so at 1, it's undefined, but at 2, it is. So we're approaching 1 from the right. Integral 2 to c of 1 over x minus 1 dx. And the 1 over x minus 1 antiderivative is just natural log. So it's the limit as c goes to 1 from the right of the natural log of absolute value x minus 1 from 2 to c. So we'll evaluate that. Everything else stays the same. This would be the natural log of the absolute value of 2 minus 1, right? which would turn into 1, and that will go to 0, minus natural log absolute value of c minus 1. Okay, so again, this is natural log of 1, which becomes 0. And we have this negative here. Oops, it's going to, wow, that's weird. It's going to come out. And when we look at what happens, to the natural log function as we get closer and closer and closer to zero, that's going to be negative infinity. So this is going to be equal to pi times negative negative infinity or positive infinity. And all this means is too bad. Can't figure out the volume because this diverges. So we cannot find the volume, okay? So big picture, that just means as uh, our function approaches the vertical asymptote 1, it doesn't do it fast enough for us to find a volume. So we're going to go back. Um, and think about comparing functions. I don't know if you recall where we're doing the growth rate of functions and comparing them. Um, but we'll go back to that. And we'll also go back to that p integral. So if we look at this theorem called the comparison test, it says, OK, if we have these two functions, and let's say that our function f is smaller than or equal to our function g. Okay. If G converges, then F is going to converge. Okay. 
So g is going to be the larger function. So let me just do a quick sketch of why this is so. And I'll do it right here. Oops, I don't want that. I want it to be thinner. Okay. So let's just pretend like this blue is g. And let's say that g converges. f is smaller. So if g converges, what that's going to do is force f to converge as well. But now let's say that the smaller function f diverges. Well, if the smaller function diverges, then the larger one will as well. Let's do a, oh, I keep doing that. Let's do another sketch. And let's just say that f does something like this. It diverges. Okay. Since g is larger, g will also diverge. Okay, so we can use this theorem and compare functions. In example 7, we want to determine if this integral diverges or converges, but look at this. This is hideous. Look at that denominator. Doing a u substitution won't help. The only chance I have of even integrating this is by doing partial fraction decomposition, which means I have to factor that denominator, and that's just way too much work. But think about this. Okay, we have this fraction and this we'll call our function f. Okay. So we have this function f. Which is x to the fifth plus 10x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus x plus 7. Okay. We have this. Why don't we compare it to 1 over the highest exponent on f is 5. What if I compare it to 1 over x to the fifth? And that will be my g. Which one is smaller and which one is larger as x goes to positive infinity? Well, if we look at this denominator here, it gets really, really large, right? I can't spell large, I guess. It gets large very fast. This one, not as large, <laughs> right? Because we're taking x to the fifth on f and we're adding a whole string of numbers so that it's gonna get larger faster, which means the whole fraction is going to get smaller faster. Okay. So when we're looking at x values that are getting larger and larger and larger and approaching infinity, this function f is going to be smaller than g. And notice that the integral of 1 over x to the fifth dx. That converges. Excuse me. I apologize for the phone ringing. So if we're looking at 1 over x to the fifth, that integral, it converges. And the reason why it converges is because it's a p integral, right? So this is a p integral. Uh, where p is equal to 5, which is greater than 1. So it does converge. And since it's larger than my integrand, I can conclude that my integral that I was given, oh, it's huge. Why did I make this so big? <laughs> 
I can conclude that this integral converges and the justification is by the comparison test. So it's not enough to just say it converges. You always have to justify your answer if you're not doing direct computations. Okay. So you can always compare to our p integrals if it fits that form. Uh, in example 8, I'm not sure what I'm going to do here. Um, I could compute the whole integral, hmm. but instead of computing the integral, and doing the limit and substituting for the infinity, maybe I can find a function to compare it to. And I'm gonna go back to p integrals again. But first of all, going back to growth functions, we had, when we did growth rates of functions from a previous section, we know that e to the x grows faster than or equal to x squared. That was one of our properties. So this is an inequality. If I flip each piece, then I flip my inequality. So that's actually pretty nice. So my integrand, which I'll call this f of x, so this I'll call f of x, and I'll call this g of x. So my function f is going to be smaller than g. And what do I know about g? Well, I know that the integral of 1 over x squared converges because it's a p integral. where p is equal to 2, which is clearly greater than 1. And since g is larger than f, I can conclude that 1 over e to the x dx converges by the comparison test. So that's nice. I didn't have to go through the whole process that we went through before. Okay, so that's it for section 8.8. .8.